G'day folks, Graham here. I'd like to welcome you to Oz Solo, a production 100% created by me. I research the show myself, I shoot the show solo, I present the show and I edit the show with no outside input. And yes, I fly the drone solo as well. On this episode, we're in WA's Midwest and we're following the mighty Murchison River from deep inland out to the Indian Ocean through some of the most spectacular outback country you'll see anywhere. So get comfortable and come along for the ride on this episode of Oz Solo. I tell you what, if there is anything that smells better than campfire smoke and bacon first thing in the morning, if they could put that in a bottle, I'd wear it as a cologne. Now, I'm about 700 clicks north of Perth right now. This is the Murchison region of Western Australia. Currently, I'm sitting on Murchison House Station. That body of water down there, that is none other than the Murchison River. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. They didn't get too descriptive with the names back in the day. <laughs> now, Murchison's gonna pop up quite a bit over the next couple of days. Right now, I'm on the far eastern end of the property. Out that way is gorge country, absolutely stunning, but I'm gonna be heading west over the next couple of days through the station to pop me out down on the coast. This station is unique. It's got river frontage and coast frontage. It's open to the public at certain times of the year, the cooler months, but due to the COVID crisis, the owners have decided to keep it closed for the foreseeable future. I've known them for a long time. I got on the horn, gave them a call. They said, yeah, please come on in. You've got the entire station to yourself. Couldn't be more stoked for two reasons. Firstly, it means I get to show you folks one of the most beautiful outback stations you'll find anywhere in Australia. It truly is stunning, but probably the better reason. There are some stories that come off Murchison House Station that if you didn't know that you could look them up yourself on the internet and get verification, you'd swear to God, I was making them up. They are that fanciful. I'm talking things like Indian princes, plane crashes, boxes full of hidden guns in the hills. Yeah, this place has seen it all. So I'm stoked to be able to spend a couple of days winding my way down to the coast. For now though, I've got a very pressing engagement that I must take care of. A bacon and egg sandwich. Please excuse me. A little bit too much chilli sauce on the old bacon and egg roll. It's one way to wake up in the morning. <laughs> All right, how did the property come to be a station? How did this parcel of land come to be the station that it is today? To explain that, we've got to go back in time a little bit. Around about 1840, three brothers doing a bit of work around the Perth area, the southwest area. One in particular, Charles Von Bibra. Now, if he'd been around today, I guarantee you he would have been a magician. You can't not be a magician with a name like Charles Von Bibra. But anyway, Charles lobbed into the Swan Colony, Perth, around about that 1840 mark and did a few bits and pieces in the area. He went down south for a while and he held a large pastoral lease down there. But one thing I really like about old Charles, he didn't muck around too much. These station tracks, man, they can be hard to follow. You just don't quite know where you are from time to time. And none of them are on maps, so you've got to sort of have a good, keen sense of direction. One thing I love about old Charlie Von Bibra, as soon as he got to Perth, he took over the pub. He took over the licensee of the pub, the Royal Hotel in Perth. <laughs> Good man. He knew what was up. Now, he must have drunk his fill there because by about 1858 or thereabouts, he decided to track north. He bumped into the banks down here somewhere, the Murchison River. 
Now, he must have really liked it because from all the reading I've done, from 1958 till about 1960, he camped on the banks of the Murchison River, just camped there. Imagine that. You go for a drive one day, you find somewhere you like, two years later you decide you'll do something. So in 1860, he finally pulls his finger out, had enough of camping, and decides he's going to build a house. Now, believe it or not, that house is still standing today and is in use by the current owners of the station, Murchison House itself. Thus the station was born, more or less. The primary reason for Von Bibra, old Charlie Von Bibra, there's a bit of a bumpy bit up through here. Let's get into this. The primary reason for Charlie Von Bibra to set this entire station up was he was breeding stud Arabian horses for the British Army in India, which believe it or not, back in the day, was the number one export coming out of the colonies. So he made a bit of cash doing that. He got sick of the place after a few years and decided to move on. He actually moved on up towards Shark Bay. Remember that, Shark Bay, and remember Von Bibra, because he's gonna pop back up in future episodes. But for now, he's left the property and it's gone on to other people. There were a number of different owners over the years. The property's had quite a few different owners. One in particular really put this station on the world map for a short period of time. And I'll introduce you to that owner a little bit further down the track. Holy heck, she is soft. <laughs> I think I'm gonna need to knock some pressure out of these tires. No, nah, nah. I'm gonna knock some air out of these tires. That is soft. <laughs> Holy heck, this stuff here, I don't know, it's like, look at, look how soft it is. It's like some sort of river sand, but going up a hill. I think what happens out here is you get those prevailing winds that come on because we're, we're quite high up here for out here and I think you get those prevailing winds. Look, I'm sinking into the sand here and it blows it blows this sand back onto the track. These tracks don't get used. They might only get used once or twice a year. And so it blows this river sand, this really coarse, soft river sand into the tyre tracks and you've just got to go down quite low in your tyre pressures in order to get up here. Another thing too, these station tracks are used by obviously the station owners out here and I don't want to be the one that cuts them up out here. So I'm going to let these, I let my tyres down before I got in. I think I'm at about 22, but I'm going to go down to 16 now and see if that makes a big difference trying to get up here. <coughs> I didn't think I'd have to do this to be honest. All right, we are down to 16 PSI. See how we go, it's not even a steep hill, it's just that sand, unbelievably soft. See what a difference that makes, eh? All right, here we go. Ah, oh. instantly, significantly better, instantly. It's just coming back down to grab the camera. And I noticed something, I wanted to give you a look at this. Have a look at this. This is a really good illustration of just how well something as simple as tire pressures work. Have a look at the furrows that have been left behind by my tires when my tires were pumped up. Look how deep they are. And then you can see just up here, this is where I was walking back and forth in front of the vehicle. And now have a look at how shallow the wheel tracks are. You can almost see the vehicle floating over the top of the sand. Tire pressures, they're everything. And don't forget your tripod. Tripods are handy too. Ah, yep, 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 yep. Oh, black swan down there. This is what I've been looking for. Huh. Have a go at this, will you? What a spot. Absolutely stunning. Get out and take a closer look. All right, this big body of water right here is called Alley Pool, and just over there, Big body of water as well called Bully Pool. Now, these two pools are some of the biggest permanent sources of water on the Murchison, this side of the homestead, before you get right back up into the gorge country up there. Of course, those gorges, so steep, any rainfall you get back up that way, it pools very easily, but here where it's so flat, unusual to get these big, big bodies of water. Now, Bully Pool, just over there, super significant because the then station owner, as I've said before, there's been a number of station owners over the years, Andrew Ogilvie owned the station here from 1855 until 1906 when tragically, tragically he was swimming in Bully Pool on a hot day and he drowned. 
uh, passing away in 1906. So despite these two spots being absolutely cracking campsites, ugh, I've always found them to be just a little bit spooky, especially at night when the wind is going through these salmon gums. Could be just me though. I might be just being a bit of a wuss. Uh, I've just pulled up here for lunch, down by the river. There's a bloody emu stuck in the mud over here, the poor bugger. He's, he's on his last legs, he's just about dead, but even if I could get him out, which I'm not going to be able to do, he wouldn't make it, he's absolutely, he's absolutely knackered, so... Oh man, I bloody hate having to do this, but I'm going to have to, have to put him out of his misery. I'm not going to show you that. Oh, the poor bugger. All right, let's just get this done. <sighs> I hate having to do that. I thought I could dig him out, but uh, when I got sort of halfway down, he started to move. I thought, yeah, 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 we're going to get him out, but he was too weak. He couldn't even, couldn't even roll over. He was knackered, and he'd busted his own leg trying to get out. His hip was all, his hip was all displaced. So. It's nature, eh? I don't like doing it, but I wasn't going to leave him there to suffer either. What a horrible way to go. You know, I'm not a religious bloke or a superstitious kind of bloke in any way, shape or form, but I've been looking for somewhere to pull over for lunch, literally, for the last two hours. And there was nothing about this spot, I just thought to myself, that'll do, I'll just pull in there, looks good enough. And there happened to be, in the middle of nowhere, of all the spots I could have pulled over, an emu that needed help, needed putting out of its misery. Now, it's not the first time that's happened to me. Once before I was out riding my motorbike, and for middle of nowhere again, and for absolutely no reason, no reason at all, I just stopped and turned off my bike and took my helmet off. And I could hear a crow. Just this weird, it was making a really weird noise, very, very close to me, this crow. Just off the side of the track, there was a crow, and he was stuck in a piece of cloth, like a, uh, the fibres of the cloth had wrapped around one of his legs. And it was a big old piece of cloth, like a towel and he just couldn't, he couldn't fly, I couldn't get away from it. And he was super calm, I just went up to him and I had my pocket knife, I just cut the towel off him, let him go and he flew off. But why, in the middle of nowhere, did I happen to just stop my motorbike and take my helmet off? Just then, why did I just choose there to stop and have lunch? Anyway, glad I did, don't like doing that, but the poor thing, well he ain't suffering anymore, so that's good. All right, let's put that behind me, let's get going. In here, one of these overhanging cliff faces, something pretty interesting I want to try and show you. Yeah, I reckon up in there, I reckon right up in there there'll be one. There you go. Get a load of these curious bits of kit. These are actually bird's nests, they're made by uh, the swallow. Incredible what they do. Fly down to the creek, they get a small little pellet of mud in their beak, fly all the way back here, and somehow create these little hollowed out chambers underneath these rocky outcrops. You often find whole bunches of them together. Really, really incredible. Once, when I was young, I found a bunch in a cave just like this, and I was doing this, looking at them, trying to see what was going on, figure out what they were. Bloody swallow come shooting out of there, nearly hit me in the head, <laughs> scared the living daylights out of me. Even to this day, well, well, I don't like doing that, it gives me the irrits. <laughs> well, I guess it's time for an explanation. 
if you haven't bumped into Oz Solo before on YouTube, you're probably wondering, what the hell is this bloke doing is bumbling around in the bush on his own? Okay, Oz Solo, 100% done by me. I research it, I shoot it, I present it, I edit it, and I upload it. I get no help from anyone else. It's kind of my thing. It's my project and it's my point of difference. So, as I always say, if the camera works just a little bit shaky, if the sound is just slightly off. Sorry, doing it all myself, having a crack and loving it. So, of course, if you're a regular old solo, you'll know exactly what this is all about. But if you're new, well, sit down, get yourself comfy and enjoy the ride. Because I know I'm gonna. I reckon you'd all be pretty familiar with the D-Max and some of the crazy places we've taken this bad boy over the years all around Australia. I was stoked when we decided to put it on a truck and ship it across to Western Australia so that I could use it over here and put it to work in what I consider to be its absolute element. These Outback Touring Tracks are exactly what this vehicle has been almost 100% designed for. Yes, it can tackle the hard stuff and to its credit, keeps up pretty darn well, but it's out here that I reckon it just does such an amazing job. The engine is designed for it, it just sips away at the fuel, it's comfortable, it's reliable more to the point, and I tell you, I'm thoroughly enjoying doing something a bit different in the vehicle that I've been pushing so damn hard on tracks that, woohoo, I'll tell you what, I put the wind up me for several years to be out here doing this. The old girl and I, absolutely loving it. Oh yeah, I got a real steep little jump up here. This is that plateau country here, all limestone boulders. Holy heck. Bloomin' heck. Might need a bit more momentum for that. Nah. Gonna need another go at it. That's unbelievable. That's really slippery. All right. A bit more dedication this time. There's a big boulder in the way, big boulder in the way. Getting into it. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Yeah. <laughs> Holy heck. That was a bit of a surprise. I didn't kind of expect that. Oh, but the view. Have a go at the view. All right, that little jump up I just did has now put me right back up on top of the plateau. I'm actually quite high up in elevation right now. And I'm gonna use this high speed Management access track here, this is what the uh, the owners and the workers on the station used to get right down the far end of the property. I'm gonna use this to take me back, all the way back down to the river now. So, fourth gear, bit of country and western, get back to the river in no time. this spot here. Ah, late afternoon. I'm gonna jump out, soak it up. Have a look at that view. Look at it. <laughs> oh, look at that, will ya? Check this place out. This right here is the highest part of the entire station and the views from up here are nothing less than spectacular. Of course, we've got station country down here, then beyond it, as far as the eye can see, absolute virgin wilderness. Down there, you can see the sea cliffs and the ocean, the little town of Calberry. You can't see it, but just down there, about half an hour away, oh, I can almost hear it. That's the sound of me cracking a beer at my campsite down by the river. <laughs> I better get going. Oh, one last look, have a look at that. <laughs> Absolutely bloody stunning.
just the slightest amount of rain around this morning, which is unusual for this time of year, but I'm guaranteeing she'll clear up and it'll be hot by lunchtime. I cannot tell you just how much of a difference having this canopy has made to the ability for me to live out of the back of the D-Max. It is absolutely unreal. Now, I wanted to show you how I've got it set up and a few little tips and tricks that I'm using. This is the passenger side, obviously, under the awning here, which is good because it's raining at the moment. The passenger side for me is the side I live out of. So this is where I do my cooking, my preparation, etc., etc. Of course, I've got the old fridge on the fridge slide down here. Now, with the fridge slide, there's always a bit of space. I use it to put salt and pepper, some herbs and spices. Of course, you never go out in the bush without your curry powder, do you? Got to have curry powder. Um, up the top here, on this frame that's built around, the clear view frame that's built around the fridge, I've mounted my, or a store, sorry, my uh, gas cooker. Now, I've been lucky enough to be able to cook on the campfire while I'm out here, so I haven't needed that. Of course, you've got to have tunes, portable radio, portable speaker goes up the top there. A little bit of country, a little bit of western. Have a look at this for an idea. Little bag I've got here. Just zip tied up on one of these braces, and in that, I keep my matches and lighter, so I know exactly where they are. Now, you're wondering, how do you get it open? It's real simple. You just go like that, get your matches out, put them back in again, and you just slide them out of the way when you don't need it. So if you need to bring the fridge out, go that way. Yeah, pretty clever, aren't I? Coffee, coffee making stuff up here, of course, we've got um, all sorts of bits and pieces up on this shelf. I've actually got my pots and pans and plates up in there. Plenty of room down the side for storage of stuff, alfoil for those massive fish that I'm gonna catch. Maybe. <laughs> Have a look at this, this is something I wanna show you. Oh, in here I've got all my food. I've got enough food in there uh, in terms of canned food and some other bits and pieces for about three weeks before I need to restock. That's fantastic. Obviously this work table is cool, but check this out. This right here is one of the Nebo flashlights. This is the Slide King. It's an absolute beauty. It's got, it's rechargeable, USB rechargeable, but it's got a magnetic base. Now, check this out for cool. Oh, that's the other thing I like about this. I store my stubby holders up on there too, so I don't lose them. You put your, you put your torch up on top of there, and then when I'm working on here, pull that out. Yeah, I've got lights so I can see what I'm doing here. So this is essentially the living area. Now, what I just wanted to show you is how I've got the trundle tray set up as well. Now look at this bad boy down here. I've never actually owned a trundle tray before on any of my vehicles, so I was pretty stoked to get this and be able to kit it out with everything I need. So of course, I've got a full tool kit down here, washing up gear down there, set of spanners down there. I've got all sorts of bits and pieces for the truck. I'm talking things like fencing wire, you always, you're going to need fencing wire at some stage, you know, spare lubricants and things. There's some castrol, brake fluid, you're always going to need that, of course. Don't go anywhere without your fire extinguisher, you're going to need that. There's so much room in here. If anything goes wrong, you always need a hammer. I'm in love with this thing, decked it out the way I like it, but what's so important is that this thing is dust and waterproof. Um, I wouldn't be keeping any of this stuff in here, fencing wire, fire extinguisher. Wouldn't be keeping all my tools in here if it let water in. But we've uh, seen that in Tasmania, when it got completely dunked, she was fine. And although it's raining today, I reckon we'll be good. So yeah, basics are, this canopy has truly changed the way I operate out of the D-Max. I'm loving it. Now, time for a coffee, I reckon. Ooh wee, that is a good hot cup of coffee. As I predicted, the rain has stopped. The sun is trying to come out. I reckon it's gonna be an absolutely beautiful day. Now, you remember yesterday I mentioned an Indian prince. Well, what the heck is going on there? The year is 1972 and his name is Mr. Jar. <laughs> it's actually got a far longer name than that, but I can't pronounce most of the words. <laughs> He's a ridgy didge prince. He's got all the power in the world. He's got all the money in the world. He's not like the singer, you know, the one that wore makeup and sang about Corvettes. Not that kind of prince. A ridgy didge prince. 1972, he's fallen in love with the place. Decided to move over here and actually run it. Someone who didn't fall in love with it was his wife. She said, nah, Jar, mate, I'm not moving out to Australia and living on a sheep station. It's not going to happen, buddy. She probably didn't say it like that because she was an Indian princess, but she would have said something very similar. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that means they've broken up. He's come out here on his own and he's run the place for quite some time. He's met a girl in Perth. She actually passed away in some pretty average circumstances. We won't go into that, but for a number of years, he's run this place on his own. Like, I mean, truly run it as a sheep station. He goes into town every now and again. The locals buy him a beer. He's got a bit of an Aussie accent after being out here for a while. I mean, I'm talking the 1970s, a small country town. It was mind-blowing that royalty was living on the station, the biggest station just outside of town. He started to get a little bit lonely, as you would. Decided he wouldn't mind having some company out here, so he made it be known <laughs> that he was searching for a wife. Now, he's a pretty dapper-looking bloke. He's got a fair bit of cash behind him, some nice silk threads, and of course, He's a bloody prince. So, as you can imagine, there were quite a few knocks on the old station door, if you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> now, he is quoted to have said, and I love this, he's quoted to have said, 
Although a lot of those ladies are absolutely lovely, none of them strike me as the sort of lady who would open a station gate for me. <laughs> anyway, he did actually find a young lady, uh, and he did quite well for himself. She was a uh, Miss Beauty pageant winner. Uh, they fell in love, they got married, and she frothed on the station as much as him, and yep, she didn't mind opening station gates. So, for a long period of time, the station was actually owned by royalty, who worked the station themselves. Fantastic story. I tell you what, Jar, mate, if I ever make it to India, I'll buy you a beer, buddy. <laughs> Here's to you. Well, I tell you what, I slept. I don't know what it is. You put me under canvas, and I just sleep so darn well. Put me in a five or six star hotel, I, you know, with the big fluffy sheets and the and the feather beds and stuff. I wouldn't sleep anywhere near as well. Put me in a swag next. Oh, just a crackle of the fire as well, just as you're going off to sleep. Oh man! All right, river on me left. Let's keep going. We got a big day today. All righty. I'm just going to make a quick detour. This spot's real special. The number of times I've popped out here late in the afternoon, coming back from a bit of a hunt, just to come out here and have a cold beer on sunset. I'm not going to explain why. I'm going to let the next bit of footage do all the talking. This will do right about here. But it's here that I've got to swap horsepower for leg power. <laughs> Check this out. is significantly steeper and higher than it looks on camera. And I reckon that if I was the lead guitarist in a rock band, that point up there would be the perfect place to do a rock and lead solo, some flames somewhere, hair in the wind, woohoo! Unfortunately, I'm not in a rock band. I can't play guitar to save me life. And well, my days are having hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> Well and truly bloody over, let me tell you. <laughs> but that, that's a spectacular view. <laughs> the station again made news, tragically this time in 1921. You see, it was December and Australia's first air mail service was just starting up. This was a big deal in the time. I mean, planes had only just been around for war purposes, etc. Never had they been used for something as significant as delivering the mail. It was cutting down the delivery of envelopes and packages by several months down to a couple of days. Perth to Derby was the suggested route. On the inaugural day, they decided to make a big deal of it, as a result of which they sent three planes. Now, one of the planes en route to Derby developed engine problems and had to land here at the station. The second plane landed nearby and the third plane began circling the station getting ready to land and join his mates. Inexplicably, the plane just nosedived, boom, caught into flames, there was nothing that could be done. The pilot and the mechanic on board were killed instantly. 
They were pulled from the wreckage. They were dressed in crisp white shirts given to the bodies by the then station owner, wrapped in white cotton and buried here on the station together. And it's here that they stay in a small graveyard just to the other side of the station homestead. 1921, yet again, the station makes news. Have a go at the erosion here. That's incredible, you know. When they do get rain out here, it just screams off these rocky hills, these rocky escarpments. And because it's so sandy down through here, nothing to hold that together. And so you just get these massive canyons through. Look at the size of that one. Absolutely incredible amount of erosion. It means sometimes crossing over them can be a little bit tricky, but that one there, no drama at all. Perhaps the most recent story that got tongues wagging and imaginations fired up to come off the station happened only a couple of years ago. I said before, the station opens up every now and again for tourists to come in and camp, generally only during the winter months when it's a lot cooler. There was a young family out here, they had a couple of kids. They were camped down by the river and they came up exploring for the day. Young kids jumped out of the car, as young blokes do, up into the hills here, foraging around, and they found in the nook of the rocks an old box, pretty unremarkable. They kind of moved a few rocks out of the way, they slid it down, had a lock on it, the lock basically broke off when they touched it. They opened it up, and inside was a submachine gun and a sawn-off shotgun, both in working condition. Now, the submachine gun, it's been dated to go back to 1917. It was actually used in World War I and World War II. The sawn-off shotgun, on the other hand, is about 30 years old, but the serial number has been scratched off. So there's no way of tracing where it came from or what it was used for. Nobody knows why the guns are there. Nobody knows how the guns got there. And of course, nobody knows who put them there. No one's come forward. The guns have since been handed over to the police. I think though, station owner Callum sums up the find perfectly. He said he'd love to see the guns rendered inoperable and put back on display in the homestead so that it showcases just another chapter in the station's rich and colorful history. However, he is the first person to admit that a sawn off shotgun does not exactly have noble origins. <laughs> I don't know what went on. I'll leave that up to your imagination. Some real soft sandy sections through here, I've got to tell you. You know, one thing I do love about this particular station that I haven't seen on other stations around Australia is the variety of terrains, you know, starting right out the east in that sort of rocky, really scrubby environment where you're dealing with really soft river sand on the tracks. Right the way through, as you get closer to the coast, it turns into rocks and out the back, right up to the north, you get that shaly limestoney stuff on the breakaway country. I love that because there's that variety in terrain that keeps the place really interesting for me. Of course, one thing you do have to be very careful of out here in station country is punctures. There's old bits of metal everywhere. The rocks are super sharp out here too. And of course, have a look at these old trees out here. Those bad boys have been in the sun for hundreds of years. And when they break off, fall on the ground, the stakes that they leave behind, man, they'll go through a tire without even flinching. That's why coming out here, I, you probably have noticed, have swapped to the set of Bridgestone Jeweler ATs. The primary reason for that, well, there's two primary reasons for that. Firstly, they are brilliant off-road, but also awesome on the blacktop, because I've had to do 700 kilometers of blacktop to get up to here. They're so quiet, so comfortable. But secondly, they offer awesome puncture resistance. And up here on this variety of terrain, with all these sharp things sticking out, I can't afford to get punches up here. So that's why I've swapped over and I'm running those Jeweler ATs up here on this station. Well, you can really see that river starting to fatten up now because we're getting down close to the mouth of the river down here. She's tidal down here. This is salt water down here now at the moment. And I must say, she's looking pretty darn good.
that big bend in the river you can see that's the last we're going to see of that river for a bit now we're about to head towards the coast a bit and the reason i'm doing that will become very clear very soon <laughs> Well, I think you'll agree, that is one heck of a view. Considering we started all the way out east, that scrubby country where the river was nothing more than a trickle. We followed it west, it's slowly gotten fatter and wider, it's become tidal, and now the mouth of the river is just down there, and that, my friends, is the mighty Indian Ocean. Also down there is tonight's camp for me. Tomorrow, I'm gonna pack up, I'm gonna track back out of here onto the blacktop, and then several hours north, to a location that couldn't be any more different than this one here, but with one very significant link. And I'll tell you about that another day. For now, I'm heading down there, getting the fishing rods out, and I'll catch you folks next time. Take care, hey? Let's get into it. Seatbelts are tricky. <laughs> Typical thing, seatbelts. You know, I'm not a religious bloke or a superstitious bloke in any way, shape or form. You can't get a seatbelt to work though, can I? Shit, man. All right, third time's a charm. For now though, I've got a very pressing engagement that I must take care of. The bacon and egg sandwich. Please excuse me. Not really, I've already eaten it. piece of muesli bar in my teeth. I slept like I, no, well like what? What sleeps? Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> <laughs>